Hello and welcome. My name is Ashley Haas and I'm the Director for Consumer Information at Benjamin Rose Institute on Aging. Thank you for joining us today for Storm Clouds or Calm Seas, the outlook of aging policies for 2024, for a lively conversation on what we can anticipate from federal aging policies in 2024, including the renewal of the Older Americans Act and healthcare reform. The webinar today will be recorded and you can submit a question at any time using either the Q&A feature or the chat feature at the bottom of your screen. We do have staff monitoring both to convey your questions to our presenters, as well as to answer any technical questions that you may have. In addition to the Q&A session at the end of the webinar, we will take questions during several points in the webinar due to the amount of topics that will be covered today. You can turn on captions by selecting live transcripts, which is the button at the bottom of your screen with two Cs. Today, we have the pleasure of hearing from two experts in the field of aging to give us, sorry, let me enable captions for our participants, to give us a perspective on how any update on how updates to aging policies in 2024 might impact our respective states and communities. First, we will hear from Mr. Robert Bob Blancato, president of Matt's Blancato and Associates and the national coordinator of the bipartisan 3000 member Elder Justice Coalition. He is also the executive director of the National Association of Nutrition and Aging Services Program and the national coordinator of the Defeat Malnutrition. Mr. Blancato has long been recognized as a national advocate with policy expertise on behalf of older adults. He has testified numerous times before House and Senate committees. His prior work history includes 17 years as a staffer in Congress. And he had an appointment by President Clinton to be the executive director of the 1995 White House Conference on Aging, one of four he has participated in. He is a member of the Senior Executive Service. As a volunteer, Mr. Blancato serves as second vice chair of the AARP board and is also in the AARP Foundation and the board of the National Hispanic Council on Aging. From 2019 to 2023, Mr. Blancato served of, on the National Advisory Committee on Rural Health and Human Services. Following Mr. Blancato's presentation, we will there, then hear from Mr. Orion Bell, President and Chief Executive Officer here at Benjamin Rose. Mr. Bell joined Benjamin Rose in 2019 with more than 30 years of experience in not-for-profit management. Prior to joining Benjamin Rose, he served as President and Chief Executive Officer at CICOA Aging and In-Home Solution, the largest of Indiana's 16 area agencies on aging. Before joining CICOA, Mr. Bell served as the American Red Cross in, at the American Red Cross in a variety of capacities. He has been an active member of the American Society on Aging and National Association of Area Agencies on Aging. He had earned both a Master of Business Administration and a Bachelor of Arts degree in History and Humanities from the University of Louisville. All right, I'm going to go ahead and get it turned over to Mr. Blancato to get us started. Just make sure that you are popping those questions in the chat or Q&A as we go along for us to address them. Bob? Thank you, Ashley. Thank you for all the work in getting this organized. We appreciate it. And uh, thank you, Julie, for moving the slides. It's a pleasure for the Elder Justice Coalition to again join Benjamin Rose and Orion for another one of our webinar series. We think this one, we hope this one will both interest and activate you based on the issues that we're going to be discussing. Um, so, and I want to commend my colleague, Laura Borth, who came up with this wonderful picture for our slide, the opening slide. And uh, with that, let's go to the first slide. And let's begin by saying happy leap day. You know, and wh what do leap days and leap year and presidential elections have in common? They both happen every four years. And as we close out February, even though if you're like me, you're saying, isn't this election over yet? We actually still have nine months until the election and less time before Congress actually shuts down for the election. And so at this juncture, we're saying, OK, do we see storm clouds or calm seas when it comes to aging policies? And my answer is it depends on the issue. So let's go. Let's start looking at some of these issues. Next slide. <clears throat> So let's start with Social Security, um, which is, you know, the biggest issue in uh, for many, many older adults and their families. Um, could there be storm clouds or is it going to be smooth sailing? I think the storm clouds would be any ideas that are presented during 2024 on Social Security's future in the presidential election and even in the congressional election. 
But the one that's more important is what is the trustees report going to say when it comes out in March? That is the annual report of those responsible for Social Security. And we all look at for when is the new date of doom? Okay, and the date of doom is when would Social Security stop paying 100% of its benefits and be paying more like 75%? Last year, the date of doom was 2033. If it moves up in any way, shape, or form, that will probably cause a lot of activity, a lot of discussion, a lot of commentary from people saying, we got to get on this quickly. It's interesting because it's now 40 years, um, look at my math, right, 40 years since the last Social Security reform bill was passed. Now, we know that both the President Biden and former President Trump want to protect Social Security. They've said it in many public settings. But the question is how? Now, the rumor we hear is that the president will propose some kind of a plan that could come as early as next week when he delivers the annual State of the Union address. We're not so clear about what President, former President Trump would have to say. But we do know from conversations and things we've heard over the years, the two most common ideas you hear, one is to raise the retirement age, which is currently 67 to 68, 69, maybe 70. And the other way is to raise the cap, how much income. In other words, if you went right now, if you make about 160, so the first $166,000 of your salary is subject to Social Security tax. People say that number should be more like 400,000 or it should be lifted altogether. Those are the two things that get most of the attention. But each of them have problems. If you raise the retirement age, you need to remember that minority older adults do not have the same life expectancy as non-minorities, okay? So you're automatically having a disenfranchising of those individuals. If you raise the cap, whatever number you raise it to, it'll be called a tax increase, which automatically makes it more controversial. So the only thing I can say that's smooth sailing with Social Security would be that there will not be any bills actually taken up this year. So there isn't anything to be concerned about relative to a bill having to be dealt with by Congress. So let's go to the next slide and talk about Medicare, where you have both storm clouds and smooth sailing here at the same time. You know, the, the smooth sailing, to some extent, was when the Inflation Reduction Act passed. Um, and people said, this is a great development, and it's historic, and all that, and it, it is. But, you know, any law that gets passed has to get implemented. And now you're at the point of implementation of the many provisions of the Inflation Reduction Act, especially the first time negotiation for drug prices in Part D of Medicare. OK, they've identified 10 drugs and the, the drug companies and Centers for Medicare and Medicaid Services are in conversation uh, about pricing. Um, and, you know, there's controversy about that. And, you know, it took a while for the companies to 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 agree uh, to go into negotiations, but now they're underway. But then you have other provisions that are kicking in earlier than the negotiation, okay? Um, such as the new smoothing arrangement. In other words, when you um, get your, your, when you have your cap that'll be imposed of, of $2,000 on out-of-pocket costs, you don't have to pay that all one time, you can pay it over each month. Um, starting in 2025, and also starting next year, there's a cap paste uh, on how much insulin can cost for people under Medicare at $35 a month. So, you know, these are smoother in sailing, um, but even then there's some controversy on the language that that's come out in, in implementing that. But at the end of the day, older adults will save money um, from the provisions of the Inflation Reduction Act. The question is how much and how soon. But the $2,000 cap um, on out-of-pocket costs is probably the most historic part of the Inflation Reduction Act in terms of having a real impact on older adults and their savings. Now, again, there's another trustees report that comes out from Medicare that's going to paint the picture of how secure Medicare Part A, the hospital plan is, and Part B of Medicare is. If, again, if it moves any sort of date of insolvency forward, um, then it would be more urgency to take up some kind of more comprehensive Medicare reform. But in the meantime, you know, this administration has been very active on the regulatory side in coming up with new ideas for Medicare service delivery, 
They have a particular interest in value-based care and looking for new ways to expand value-based care throughout the system. And then you have Medicare Advantage, which has become where they're, the smooth sailing from their standpoint is the fact that it continues to grow. Almost half of people in Medicare now are in Medicare Advantage. However, there are storm clouds there as well, because now there is greater scrutiny on the part of Congress and now also in the administration on how they market those Medicare Advantage plans. Okay, Are they actually accurate? Are they providing what they say? And there's another concern about high rates of claims denial when people go to get the benefits. Remembering that Medicare Advantage has unique qualities that allow for a bunch of non-medical supplemental services from nutrition or transportation that are not under Medicare fee-for-service at this point. So if you're looking ahead, well, I don't see any major Medicare reform bills coming up in 2024, again, because of the election. One thing that you could almost predict is that as Medicare Advantage continues to grow and as they continue to utilize these non-medical supplemental services, uh, the advocates for fee-for-service Medicare are going to say, hey, we should be doing the same thing. They should have the same opportunities. And it'll be interesting to see how that plays out as time goes forward. So I've covered two topics. I will stop and ask Ashley or whoever if anybody has a question we might want to address at this point. So there is a question in the chat. If anyone else does have a question, please feel free to go ahead and submit it either in the chat or in the Q&A. So we had a question come in that said, why not put Social Security on an actuarial basis that, preserve inter that preserves intergenerational equity instead of the economic cash concept, recognize the earned benefits funding shortfall as a liability and immortalize it over, say, 70 years so it's not limited by an artificial time horizon? That is a very profound question uh, on the part of that individual. And uh, I, I, my, one of my immediate suggestions is that um, since the topic of social security reform is sort of wide open, and since this is the idea, this is the time for ideas to be generated, um, you know, this, this ought to be shared. The, the individual should share his thoughts and suggestions with his either member of Congress or his senators and say, you know, um, get an idea or, or even ask even better, have, have that individual contact their House member or senators and ask them, if they can get the Library of Congress to do an analysis of, you know, how this would work. Because, um, again, I, I understand the premise of the question. Um, I've heard it raised in other settings before. Um, but it would be a big change, obviously. And, you know, I don't know how. Well, let me go back a second. If you remember 1983, um, when Social Security was facing a genuine fiscal crisis, a genuine crisis, because they came up, the, the actuaries came up and told Congress, if you don't put some new revenues in this program, we're going to have trouble paying benefits in 1984. So they did what was considered almost impossible to do politically. Okay? They raised the retirement age. They mandatory enrolled over a million people into Social Security. They taxed benefits for the first time in Social Security. They delayed the cost of living increase by six months and one or two other pretty controversial provisions, but made it into a package. And that's the key to Social Security reform. Individual things like raising the cap or raising the retirement age are not going to solve the long-term issues around Social Security. You know, the, the suggestion in that question has a deeper, probably deeper consequences, and it's worth analyzing. So I, I appreciate the question. I'm not going to comment. I don't have enough knowledge about that to, to give you a, a you know, a detailed answer, but I think it's wonderful that it was raised. And thank you. And please share it with your elected folks. Thanks, Bob. We have several questions come in about Medicare. So the first says, do you anticipate a Medicare Advantage backlash after 2025 as claim denials or restrictive HMO networks for older adults diagnosed with cancer increase beneficiary, beneficiary satisfaction? I, I think the answer to that question is likely yes. Um, I think that the backlash issue is already beginning. Um, I think it's going to become the responsibility of the Medicare Advantage um, programs to, you know, come to grips with this issue around claims denial and especially the one that you're speaking about. Um, I think what you're going to be looking at in 2025 is a more serious and in-depth look at Medicare overall. 
which will include Medicare Advantage. And I think, you know, as the data comes in and as the um, both the data and the anecdotes come in about what Medicare Advantage is or is not doing, it'll be front and center in any Medicare reform conversation that happens. But that's a 2025 issue, which one has to remember that, you know, that ha that's comes to play where, you know, we, we all talk about the presidential election, which is important, but we have the whole House of Representatives up for re-election in 2024 and one third of the Senate. And as I'll talk about later in the slide, you know, if there's any change in the leadership in the House or the Senate, that has impact on what could what would you, what would be included in Medicare or would not be included. But I think you're on you're on the right track in suggesting that there's going to be a deeper look at Medicare Advantage for that reason in 2025. And somebody just said we skipped a question, so let's see if we can find that question. Yeah, so they're not necessarily answered in order. Um, oh, okay, good. <laughs> or asked in order, sorry. So there were just a couple of clarifying questions about Medicare. So um, that participant asked, is Medicare Part B costs going up and is there adva an advantage in addition to the basic fee? Oh, well, yes, is, part, is uh, advantage, yeah, sorry. No problem, yes, the, the Part B premium uh, will go up in uh, 2024. I don't have the number in front of me, but we can certainly provide it to you afterwards. And the second part of the question was, Ashley? Um, let me go back to it, sorry. Yeah, uh, no problem. Is Advantage in addition to the basic fee? So I'm assuming maybe is uh, is there a cost to the Medicare Advantage? In well, maybe there, if they could clarify that question yeah. in the comment. Well, I, I mean, they, 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 there's, a, there's costs associated with Medicare Advantage. The issue with Medicare Advantage that uh, people like as I mentioned, was all the other services that they cover that are outside of the traditional Medicare. But the problem in some instances is the network that provides the services somewhat narrow um, and the Medicare Advantage controls, you know, which doctors you can go to and things of that nature, which concerns people. Um, but I think we'll, we'll try to get that answer on the Part B um, premium while we're on this uh, webinar. Thanks. Anyone else? Yeah, there, there are actually a few more questions. Someone asked if you had any comments on the proposed legislation on management of duels. I believe that it's we we need to be doing more in that dual space. I think it's becoming there's, there's those, those those numbers are increasing, and I think it's very important that they be given separate attention in the uh, in the time period ahead. Um, and the legislation that I understand is out there um, is necessary and needed and. It belongs as part of any any Medicare um, reform package and, and and Medicaid reform package because duels are about being eligible for both Medicare and Medicaid. But their numbers are, are increasing much faster than people would guess. And I think now you're seeing more attention being focused, and I think you'll see even more going forward. So thank you for that. Thank you. And someone asked, what are the expected savings to Medicare and beneficiaries as more drugs drugs come under price controls and how were the drugs included in the selection? Well, as I recall, as I understand, and we can verify this down the road, the ones that were chosen um, were those that had incurred the highest price increases um, that, you know, were above inflation. And the, the goal, obviously, of negotiation is to bring down the cost of drugs and those that were particularly high um, in cost were targeted to be in that first group of 10. Um, and as far as the savings are concerned, you know, it's all gonna depend on what the price ends up being after the negotiation. And nobody really knows that yet. The only thing you can say is that if you're if your out of pocket costs are three or four or five thousand dollars and a cap goes into place um, you know, in, in next year at two thousand dollars, then you can calculate the savings on that. It's gonna take a little longer to know exactly uh, how much you're going to save um, until the negotiation process is over. Thank you. There are several more questions. We I may not this. be able to address them all. Right. <laughs> so if we, if we, if there are questions that we're not able to address during the webinar due to time constraints, we will make sure that we get you an answer and email you later on after the webinar. Do you yeah. think maybe one more, Bob, for right now? Sure, and I'll see people answering my answering other people's questions, which is even better. That's, <laughs> you, can't, you can't beat that, right? So sure, let's do one more. All right. So Christopher said you mentioned that the administration is big on value-based purchasing, but the evidence of cost control is about zero, and quality improvement is small. Is this going to work 
as a strategy in the long term? That's another interesting question. Um, Value-based care and value-based purchasing may be two different things, but um, the expectation in advancing value-based care is that you will be you know, paying for just what is needed as compared to a range of other things that may have been paid for in the past. So from that standpoint, one could assume there'll be some, some degree of savings. On the purchasing side, I'm not as clear on that piece. Um, but again, as, as Ashley said, we will try to embellish on this uh, based on these questions as we go through the webinar and beyond. All right, thank you. All right, I guess we'll flip to Medicaid now, uh, because I'm sure that'll generate some other questions. And there are a lot of storm clouds around Medicaid for two reasons. Uh, one is this whole issue about redetermination that occurred after the provisions that were in the pandemic expired. And presently, you have 17.4 million people who have been knocked off the Medicaid rolls, including 658,000 in your own state of Ohio. And um, 70% nationally and in the, just in Indiana alone, I think they put this slide in for you, Orient, because of your Indiana background. I want to know, keep you up to date on stuff. Yeah. Um, they were disenrolled for paperwork and procedural reasons. But, you know, the human consequences of that, you know, when these people are disenrolled, the problem is where are they going to go? Where do they go, if, you know, for health care? And this is becoming a real human issue. Um, and as these numbers continue to grow, it may cause a revisiting back to um, what was in the legislation uh, before redetermination took effect. And the other thing that's going to be stormy for Medicaid is the, the expiration of the Enhanced Federal Matching Funds, or FMAP, which occurred at the end of 2023. The Congressional Budget Office estimates the states are going to receive $58 billion less in federal Medicaid funds in fiscal year 24 than they did in fiscal year 23. And, you know, that's a big chunk. And this comes at a time when states that may have enjoyed surpluses during the pandemic because of an enhanced federal funding of all kinds, now all of a sudden are facing much more difficult fiscal conditions. And you tack on a $58 billion total. Um, to you know, extra cost at the state level for Medicaid, that's gonna increase the situation. And it will lead to, as it says, a 17.2% increase in state Medicaid spending. And so you know, these two things together um, are gonna impact Medicaid. And the question will be, what will it lead to relative to any activity next year in terms of Medicaid reform? And to me, that answer rests a lot with what happens in the election. And, you know, which party ends up running which which house or which Senate. And, you know, it's it's speculative at this point, but we can expect the consequences of these two things will force action in Washington in 2025, I'm sure. And of course, we don't know the, the unknown impact of what statewide managed care that Ohio and 33 states are doing managing Medicaid with uh, MCOs. So these three things together, to me, indicate that Medicaid's got a lot more storm clouds over it than it does comp C's. But then just to make it even more fun, let's go to the next slide. The one that people all ask about, what in the hell is going on in this town in Washington with funding for the fiscal year that began that began October 1st? Okay, now you're all watching the drama here, right? We, we passed these things called continuing resolutions. There's two explanations for continuing resolution. The, the literal one is the continuing resolution means that you are funded at your current level to a date certain. Continuing resolution also means that Congress once again did not do their job and finish the work on the appropriations bills in time for the beginning of the fiscal year. So under the current situation, I must stress this, as you'll see the line, a couple bullets down, you'll see a large type thing there. Under the current continuing resolution that we're under, the first deadline for a government shutdown of federal agencies or 20% of the government would be tomorrow. Okay, where agencies like the Department of Agriculture, if they don't have their funding bill passed, uh, they could shut down on at midnight on tomorrow night. The second big deadline is just a week later, where 80% of the federal budget, which includes the Departments of Labor, Health and Human Services, Defense, and so on, um, would have the same possibility. If you don't have a funding bill passed, then there could be a shutdown of those agencies. 
Now, the new development, literally since these slides are written, and they were only sent to Ashley yesterday, so it tells you how things happen in this town. Congressional leaders have agreed on a new continuing resolution with two new dates of, two new deadlines of March 8th and March 22nd, okay? Now, a vote is supposed to occur in the House today to pass this bill. The Senate has committed to that if the House passes the bill today, they'll take the bill up tonight and get it on to the president in time for anything, no shutdown to happen. Now, the difference between this continuing resolution and the one we're in now is that the, the deadline of March 8th uh, includes a two other federal agencies, bringing it total to six agencies that would have to have their bills done by March 8th or face a shutdown. And on March 22nd, they added the Department of Homeland Security funding to the defense funding and HHS funding, meaning you know the three most controversial bills there are for funding each year are Health and Human Services, Defense, and now Homeland Security. So this, this new continuing resolution adds that to the group in the March 22nd deadline. Now, the biggest storm that, we're, that has most people in this town worried would be April 30th, which is if all this is not done, with, you know, any deadline you throw in, but you get to April 30th and you're not done, there will be across the board cuts applied to those agencies that do not have their funding bills passed. And how big a cut is not known, okay? It's at least 1%, it could be considerably higher. And so right now, this is the current situation relative to funding for fiscal year 2024. Um, I, I, I would be lucky, if I was lucky, we would see the House pass the bill while we're on this webinar, but I think it's gonna take a little later in the afternoon, but it's gonna be one of these drama things because the Freedom Caucus, which is a fairly influential group of House Republicans has already come out against this new continuing resolution, which means that for the bill to pass under the rules that the speaker has asked, Two thirds of those voting have to pass, have to vote for this for it to pass, which means that the only um, way that this could pass is if Democrats help the speaker get this thing over the line. But that will could, that could come with its own consequences because you remember that the previous speaker, Kevin McCarthy, got tossed out of his job because of cooperating with Democrats, and it's not clear if the new speaker could say have the same fate. Having done, this, having done this a second time now in his four months in office. So this is the drama you don't really see every day in your newspaper, but trust me, it's real in this town and we'll see how this plays out. So before I go to the next topic, let's see if Medicaid or funding questions have come in or relate, older questions from before. I see a lot of stuff going on here, so. There is, everyone's very active today, wonderful. So Gilbert asked, do you anticipate these Medicaid storm clouds will lead to Medicaid MCOs expanding to more than 33 states or Medicaid payment cuts in some states? Probably it's probably a combination of the two, but um, it's, it's, gonna, it's gonna really depend on how successful the whole statewide managed care MCO thing works out. Um, and, you know, we don't know that until much farther down the road. Some of them are just starting this year. Some are relatively new. Um, but it'll be watched very carefully in the whole context of, you know, what, what we do in the future with Medicaid. Thank you. And then we had a question. Do supplementary benefits generate savings or reduce service utilization? Supplementary, you mean under Medicaid Advantage? Is that what the question is? I'm trying to. I'm assuming that that's where it's from. Yeah. Uh, they were still talking about that in the chat at that time. Right. So, do those supplement accomplish savings? Is that the question? Um, you know, it's hard to know. I mean, you'd have to look at the data that comes back from the managed Medicare Advantage plans and which supplemental services they chose to to fund and support, and did they accomplish? Again, one of the motivations on all this is to promote greater home and community-based care options for people on, um, on Medicare by offering these things like nutrition services, transportation services, and the like. Um, but a lot of it's gonna depend on the utilization um, of people in Medicare Advantage, which services they decide to fund, and how you calculate savings. It's always been a, a challenge to, to say, 
if you keep a person in home and the assumption is it's cheaper than putting them in a nursing home or hospital. And it's probably true, but you need to document that. You need to see more concrete data. So it's probably too early to make the judgment on that, but it'll be monitored very closely as we go deeper into Medicare's uh, future. Thanks, Bob. We do have some additional questions um, that date back a little bit. So I was wondering if anyone had any additional questions related to Medicaid. Um, let's see. So Bob, I, Bob, I don't have a have a question, but just a, a just a quick comment on the the Medi Medicaid managed care and the dual eligible programs. If you talk to the state uh, units on aging and the Medicaid offices in the states. Um, uh, like advancing states in those groups, there certainly is a sense amongst those organizations that Medicaid managed care is an effective tool, um, and it doesn't even see, it doesn't even feel like it's debated much. It's just sort of seen that that's the way forward and a way to uh, harness some of the expertise and some of the capacity of the insurance plans. So I I, I would expect it to expand um, just because it just seems to be so much a part of the industry. Yeah, it's a good point, and I and I'm, I'm I I agree with you, and I think that that's you know um, the proof is as these plans un unfold and how they work, and it's actually interesting to see you know where the states have chosen only one carrier or one primary company, and ones that have chosen several. You know that's competition within competition to some extent, and you know that could also factor into how how well it's received. Okay, we'll come back, I guess, and then we'll go now to a topic that a lot of us are interested in, which is the Older Americans Act. Um, and again, stormy skies or calm seas, it's a mixed bag again. Um, I guess the calm seas uh, were achieved most recently when the release of the final rules for the 2020 Older Americans Act reauthorization. Now, those of you who went to, you know, had government classes, you know that uh, you pass a law and that's only part of the issue. And somebody's got to actually in, interpret the intent of Congress on how the thing is actually going to run. And that is the Department of Administration for Community Living of the Department of Health and Human Services that's responsible for the Older Americans Act. So they're the ones who produce these regulations. But what is amazing, really, for a lot of us who've been working around the Older Americans Act, these are the first regulations to govern the act since 1988 which means that, you know, um, the aging network has sort of done it on its own. Um, and, you know, a ACL has given them guidance, but now they have actual regulations they have to adhere to. Um, and the one of the reasons they did it, honestly, is because the world changed dramatically since 2020 when the last reauthorization was done. Just take the pandemic alone and what it did to day-to-day -day operations in the aging network. And so, Updates were clearly needed, um, but what's fascinating about this whole process, and those of you who are in the aging network on this webinar, you know what I'm gonna talk about, which is the remarkable ability of this network to pivot and keep things going without a playbook when a pandemic happened. Astounding amount of work that was done. State units, area agencies, nutrition providers, other providers, you know, they, they saw the situation, they went after it, and they, and they just did what they had to do to keep things going. And one of the key things that were done over time were developing these new flexibilities, especially in the nutrition program, which is the largest program in the Older Americans Act. Um, flexibilities like providing virtual programming, to allowing now under these regulations, 25% of congregate funds to go for uh, shelf stable, pick up, carry out, um, you know, drive by meals, whatever it may be. Um, and these are all very important in terms of understanding what things work, what didn't work. I, if I, I hear stories all around the country about nutrition, about the restaurant partnerships that were established as a result of the pandemic to do two things. One, to help preserve the nutrition program and also to help preserve a local restaurant who might otherwise suffer tremendous loss of uh, customers. And this has been well received by the older adults and because you got to remember, just for for statistical purposes, to show you how much this program was turned on its head in the pandemic, two thirds of older adults in the Older Americans Act Nutrition Program before the pandemic, two thirds were served in congregate settings, senior centers and the like. Within a week or two after the pandemic kicked in late in March of 2020, 95 percent of these folks were getting their meals at home. 
and or getting, you know, uh, grab and go kind of things. So that's a huge change that had to be implemented overnight with, you know, not necessarily all the necessary resources until Congress passed money to enhance the funding for the Older Americans Act. So these regulations are designed to take the best of what occurred during the pandemic uh, in terms of flexibility and make them into the final regulations. And it also did a couple other things. It also has greater recognition of LGBTQ older adults, and I'll come to that in the next uh, slide. And also, um, you know, the whole question about in, in the caregiving space, um, these regulations say that older, older relative caregivers and older relative caregivers of those with disabilities are to be given priority in services under these regulations. And we're going to come back to caregiving a little bit later. So let me go to the next slide and talk about, you know, the reauthorization of the Old Americans Act. That term means reauthorization means you take a law and renew it for a period of time. Um, this upcoming one could either see storm clouds or it could be a very calm seas process. One of the keys to answering that question will be, is it going to be bipartisan as it has been in the past? Now, you know that, you know, it's been difficult to get bipartisanship on a lot of issues that used to be automatic. Um, we are hoping and I'm happy to note that they have already created a uh, bipartisan Senate working group for the reauthorization of the Older Americans Act, which is a very good sign. The other question that we, we think about a lot here, which is, you know, there are three kinds of reauthorizations. You have what you call a simple reauthorization where you just take the date of expiration of the law and just add three years or five years to it and make no real changes. The second kind is what they call a tweak where you take a couple of areas of the act and update a few things, change a little bit of language, you know, do whatever is necessary to quote unquote modernize it going forward. But the third kind is what's called a transformational reauthorization. That would mean something like adding a new title to the act or making real fundamental changes to an existing title of the act. You know, something that really, really shows a major change. Okay. And, you know, at this juncture, it's hard to know which way we're going to go. Um, the process is just starting. The major, major aging groups are just now developing their priorities. But then, and again, in large type, something that happened since the time I sent these slides yesterday, the Senate Health, Education, Labor, and Pension Committee, which is responsible for the Older Americans Act in the Senate, has just announced their first hearing on the reauthorization, which will be on March 7th, which is next week. And more details will be out later today. And um, We'll be happy to share them with you as we learn about them. As I think about it, trying to guess where things are going to be, I think we're going to see a new focus on senior centers, um, But because I, I think there's been a, an effective amount of conversation about uh, the importance of senior centers, whether they maintain the name senior center may be another interesting question, or whether they become community centers or intergenerational centers or whatever it may be. But there's now a growing recognition of their importance for achieving the goal of keeping folks in their communities and at home. Um, I expect there to be some strengthening of the family caregiver program. And um, one of the folks on this, one of the 265 people that seem to be on this webinar right now uh, is a, a dear friend of both Orion and myself, uh, Carol Zerniel, who has the role of being the chair of the RAISE Family Caregiver Advisory uh, Council. and. I'm fully expecting her to throw something into the chat or go live if she wishes to talk about how the family caregiver program could get strengthened um, in the next reauthorization. Um, the most important thing it needs is more money. Okay, I mean that this program. This is the only. Let's understand one thing. This is the only existing federal program directly helping family caregivers, and its funding level is less than 250 million dollars for the whole country, while caregiving has exploded in this country. And we all know the importance of the training of a family caregiver so that the situation makes them better at being a family caregiver. So I'll look forward to something from Carol when she has the chance uh, to talk about that. I also expect in the nutrition program to be a lot of changes because the area, the whole area has changed in that space. You know, we had a White House conference on hunger, nutrition and health back in uh, late last, in late 2022. And some of the things they're talking about these days are improving the quality of food that's available to address the growing problem of older adult malnutrition, where we have one 
of every two older adults is either at risk or is malnourished. And then the whole notion of medically tailored meals um, and getting them higher on a profile and support and culturally appropriate meals, okay, which again is important for nutrition programs to maintain their attendance, um, to have to have meals that, you know, folks in their community recognize and want to come and eat. And then the last thing I think that we'll see will be in the Older Americans Act, as many of you know, it targets their services to older adults in the greatest economic or social need, um, which includes a range of things, but it does not to this date include LGBTQ. Um, and the advocates for the, for the constituency are doing a really good job to get them added in the greatest social need category. And I think this time around, it could very well happen. So that is a, um, let me go one more slide, which relates to um, the Older Americans Act Title VII, um, where this is sort of the elder abuse prevention section, um, which is a particular interest to our elder justice coalition. We wanna see Title VII made stronger. Um, it has funding for adult abuse prevention programs, the long-term care ombudsman, a Native American elder justice program and legal assistance program. First thing we gotta do is make sure all those things get funded, okay? The one that is not funded, has never been funded, is the Native American Elder Justice Program. And that's just, that's a travesty at this stage in life, knowing the prevalence of elder abuse in, in tribal communities and the need for services and resources to go there. And we also, we also need to have the Older Americans Act be more coordinated with the Elder Justice Act, the comprehensive law, which I'll talk about a little bit later, because already, the Administration for Community Living has, for example, the Adult Protective Services Resource Center. And for the first time, there is funding, direct dedicated funding for Adult Protective Services in the Administration for Community Living budget. So I will pause there before we move on to the next topic and see who's come in with interesting questions, comments, criticisms, whatever it may be. We'll take them. Thanks, Bob. There have been several back and forth comments. Um, someone did ask, do you think that legislators will address the role of nonprofit volunteer aging in place villages? Must be Barbara Sullivan. <laughs> That's correct. <laughs> See, I know my I know my friends that come on this thing. Uh, hey, Barbara, you got a network out there. You want that to come together? Let's well, get so moving on. Let's get advocacy moving on that. Uh, you know, it, it, if you don't bring it up and and find your champion, you know, may not happen. So um, let's talk about that. Yeah, so it was actually Mary Jo Deering that asked that question, but Barbara oh. did comment. Okay, well, thank you. Thank you both for raising the question. And I think it's it's time that you raise that question because, you know, they are a, an increasingly important component of our home and community-based service network, okay? And the one thing that, you know, I, and I've had the pleasure of working with Barbara and the uh, Village to Village Network for a long time, you know, this is one of the more the truly organic movements that ever occurred in this country. You know, um, people helping each other at the local level, doing, um, you know, looking out for your neighbors, doing the things that we all talked about wanting to do in our lives. And if it, during the pandemic, um, it was even more of a challenge to maintain the villages and to keep them. But in fact, they continue to grow because they're recognized as being essential to uh, a lot of people in these uh, in our communities. And so um, I see you, Barbara. Thank you for that. Um, you know, feel free to write a long chat thing or just jump on if you want. But, um, you know, it's probably time if, if there's a if there's a federal piece of legislation where the villages could fit, uh, it would be in the Older Americans Act. So we should look at that and see uh, the best way to proceed. And then Carol wanted to thank you for mentioning the Rays Council. She said that we need everyone to take the national strategy, pick those items of most importance to them, and help us implement them. Very good. And I'm going to come to that a little bit later in this presentation. And I, and I totally agree with you. And I'll tell you why when I get to that point. Um, anyway, continue. I can't, I'm trying to, you know, I'm doing the wrong thing. I'm reading everything and I shouldn't do that. I should let you do that. <laughs> There's lots of back and forth commentary. I love it. This is great. This is great. 
Yeah, so um, Sharon Willen said that she stands with Barbara and Mary Jo, not only formal villages, but non-affiliated neighbor-to-neighbor networks. Most of us are part of the missing middle, not eligible for support, but not wealthy. Oh, a new comment came in, so it changed, sorry. Uh, let me go back to that. But not wealthy enough to hire sufficient help at home. You know, that last point is very interesting because, you know, the missing middle seems to be, you know, a local term. I hear it in my community of Arlington, Virginia. But if you look deeper at it, um, that is a very important um, focus from a policy standpoint, because there are a lot of things where the missing middle, um, you know, are being impacted. Issues are like eligibility, availability of services, housing, uh, things of that nature. And, you know, if the advocates for missing middle at local level started to galvanize and organize a little bit, um, they could start to have some impact on policy. Very good. I, I've actually heard that, Mary Jo. Um, I talked to somebody from uh, working for Governor Moore on their whole new longevity project in Maryland. So that's going to be a very important piece. Boy, it's a good thing I don't don't let me open up this chat or Q and A because I'll be talking at everybody's <laughs> questions here. But anyone do one more? Ashley? Yeah, let's do one more. Um, so kind of to switch um, topics a little bit, um, Lauren Hickman said, "Could you speak more about the LGBT services being addressed?" And uh, they wanted to mention that it's such a vulnerable po vulnerable population for sixty five plus. Yes. What it, what it comes down to is basically this. For this community to achieve a, a very important legislative goal, they need to be added to the group that is considered in the greatest the greatest social need under the Older Americans Act. Right now, social need is, you know, rural, limited English speaking, and several other categories. Um, but to have LGBTQ added to that list of greatest social need, you know, would mean that the services in the Older Americans Act would be targeted to them as well as other groups in that category. But right now they're just on the fringe of being in that in that category. These regulations sort of move the needle a little bit, but you need to put that into the actual legislative language of the Old Americans Act reauthorization. And uh, Ashley, I should point out um, that I may be at my limit here um, and we don't want to make sure that Ori gets his time too. So you decide as, as, the, as, the, as the chief Moderator there, let us know how we should proceed here. Thanks, Bob. Thank you. Uh, we'll, Thank go ahead great, Bob. <laughs> we'll go ahead and let Orion make a few points and then we can jump back to Q&A. Okay. Thank you. All right. Well, thanks. Uh, thanks so much. Uh, just a, a couple of quick comments and I'll, and I'll go quickly because I think the, the dialogue is great. But just a, a couple of things from the, uh, say from a view from the North Coast, a little bit of some things maybe we see from here in Ohio. Um, and we can skip to the next slide. Uh, just as a reminder, and the next one, uh, just a reminder that in Ohio, that March 19th is primary ballot. Uh, so a lot of a lot of races. I've very closely watched Senate race in Ohio because there is a challenge to uh, the incumbent uh, in that seat, and that one's anticipated to be hotly contested. But we also have a lot of state races and activities going there. And locally, there's a human service levy in Cuyahoga County, which Ohio is a state that relies a lot on local property tax levies for human service programs. And uh, Cuyahoga, Cuyahoga County's is up for a renewal. And so there's a lot of attention on that, at least here in our community. We'll go to the next slide. Um, and uh, then the, the ballot races in November, we can go on to the next one uh, for that. Uh, just a lot of things in, in Ohio that will be changing, uh, and this is reference to the state legislature, is that the Republicans have a veto-proof majority in the House and Senate, uh, and, they've been, and they've been shown to override the governor's veto, even though he's also a Republican on a couple of pretty prominent things in the last, um, uh, the last legislative cycle. We, we can go on to the next one. Uh, but there's, there's going to be some changes. So in the House, we have term limits in Ohio. And so 14 Republicans and seven Democrats are retiring or are term limited in the Ohio House. So that's about 20 percent of the uh, folks who currently have a seat won't be able to be there or if announced they aren't going to be there uh, after the uh, after the next election. We go on to the next one. Uh, in the Senate, it's not quite as many people, but it's it's important ones to watch because five senators who are term limited and they have they have significant roles in the state Senate currently. Uh, 
Matt Huffman, who's the current Senate president, can't run for his Senate seat again. Uh, Matt Dolan, who uh, is the current finance chair, uh, is term limited. He cannot continue in that. In fact, he's one of the candidates for the, the, the Senate seat. Um, uh, Senator Hackett, who uh, is the current is the insurance uh, chair, and he's been a big advocate for disability and aging uh, policies in the in the state of Ohio. Uh, Senator Coons, who is in the, from the Columbus area, is the transportation chair, which also has a lot of impact on aging questions. And then uh, Senator Sykes, who's a ranking member, he's the the Democrat on the finance committee. Um, and if you're in Northeast Ohio, uh, three of these people are also local legislators for if you live in uh, Akron or, or uh, Cleveland or the, the, the surrounding counties in, in, uh, in our community. So there's a lot of change happening there on the Senate side for us to look at. Uh, go on to the next one. There's not much to say about legislation because they haven't passed a whole lot. Uh, we do think there may be some conversations about housing, particularly around property tax assessments for older adults, because there was a Senate, a Senate Select Committee that talked about this this uh, this year, and that seemed to be something that resonates as, as a bipartisan possibility uh, for addressing that as a concern for older adults and property taxes in the state. Um, we can go on to the next item. Um, and but a couple of things, and these are not these are not legislative, but there are a couple of big policy things that I think in the state people will keep an eye on. Uh, first is uh, some activity out of the Nursing Home Quality and Accountability Task Force uh, that met last last year. Uh, they have approved uh, out of that effort at the state level some additional funding for regional ombudsman programs. I know that's one of the things Bob was going to talk about a little bit. Uh, and they've also launched a state level nursing home quality navigator that pulls some of the information from the uh, nursing home compare information that's available on the federal sites, but also includes some more local information, including some transparency around some of the evaluations and ratings of those programs. And th that came out of a, a, a Department of Aging uh, initiative uh, in a governor's task force last year. And go on the next slide. And the other one I think we're interested in watching in Ohio is that the expansion of the PACE program, that seven new providers that are going to serve nine additional counties, and those are listed here. Uh, Ohio has been sort of slow to the game of adopting PACE programs, and uh, we're excited to see this develop. And those, those have been awarded, and so you'll start to see some notifications about those standing up in 2024. So we're excited about that. So... Uh, there are there are some things happening in the state, and you see some nice connections between things we're talking about in the state of Ohio and things that are happening at the federal level, and hopefully that uh, that can continue in a positive way. And um, I think we should go back to the Q and A. Thank you, Orian. So we have many, many comments, many questions coming in. We're obviously not going to be able to address them all today. But just again, as a reminder, um, I will pull them from the chat and the Q&A and we will address them. It may take us a little bit of time because there are so many. So it's just some comments that I did want to bring to everyone's awareness. Uh, awareness. Natasha Petricola, who was um, a, pr a previous presenter for our December webinar, uh, she just made a point about um, Adult Protective Services. So she said, very concerned about APS programs being able to sustain as there may be increasing needs with older adults requiring services and assistance. You are absolutely right. And I will tell you, is it, there's, a, there's a crisis right now in securing limited funding for Adult Protective Services. Right now, we are facing a situation where the Senate is supporting a $15 million funding level for APS that was included last year. But the House bill has a zero for APS, okay? And it is imperative that the Senate bill prevail. It's imperative that people contact your entire delegation in Ohio and urge them to support a $15 million funding level for APS. And separately, we're also trying, working with some other members of Congress, to get as much of that $376 million uh, that went into the Elder Justice Act continued, the money that was put in during the pandemic, that was a majority of that was APS money. So we're working the funding situation on two fronts. But the one that's most immediate is the FY24 funding level for APS. And it's imperative that folks communicate with everybody on your in your delegation on that. And all yet and later on, I would I'll close with a resource page that has a bunch of contacts where you can follow up with some of the things we talked about today. 
Thank you, Bob. Uh, Sharon would like to know what kind of national action is focused on increasing and improving the, the labor force for home-based care, both personal care and medical care? You know, that's that's an issue that's about, in my judgment, to, to become the dominant issue. Um, there are activity, there are members of Congress on both sides that really want to increase the commitment on the workforce at all levels. Um, and I think the, the the prospects of getting something done in the near future are pretty good because I know when you have the kind of bipartisanship that's been talked about in workforce, um, it will it could lead to something. I think the other thing to watch, and if we'd ever reached the point where immigration would stop being the polarizing issue that it is, and was connected to increasing the workforce uh, and helping the workforce, um, those two things need to be blended in, a, in just in that one space. In other words, how do you improve, how do you increase in the capacity on the workforce? It's going to require some immigration reform to do that. And so um, while I have nothing specific at the moment, um, I am confident that this issue has risen to the point where it's going to be it's going to be addressed. It could actually get addressed in a lame duck session of this Congress after this election. Um, and, you know, I will. Uh, um, we're working with Ashley, we'll, we'll try to identify where we think the activity is going to be on workforce. Thanks, Bob. Um, there are just so many things coming in. Kimberly Hodges, um, she did uh, post a link in, in the chat at one uh, forty-five. She said, this is a great multi-collaborative resource on implementing the raised family caregiver strategy and it's supportcaregiver.org. So that link is in there for everyone to check out if they're interested. We have time for a couple more questions. Patricia Hawkins said, challenges to DEI threaten targeting to minorities and others socially in need. How will this be addressed? Well, that's going to be that's a, a very interesting question that um, one of the hardest questions is going to be is how do you regulate that uh, from a legislative perspective? Um, you know, and what, what can, at the federal level, can you do to ensure that DEI uh, commitments are honored and made? The challenges you talk about are coming from corporate America and entities that are just not prepared to embrace DEI or understand it or make the commitment necessary to achieve it. And you know what it will. You know when the when the federal government gets involved in something um, that isn't necessarily their normal space, it takes something that really prompts um, action. Okay, like. All of a sudden, artificial intelligence, which was way outside the realm of people in Congress, now all of a sudden is a vocal point on the regulation side because they see potential harm that's involved. Um, you, you have to almost put it in that context. If failure to address DEI is, is disenfranchising, discriminating against people and their opportunity to get better positions, better jobs, you know, then it's responsibility of people who are advocates to push that. And so... Um, I don't know exactly where DEI is going to end up in the legislative agenda, but I think as the challenges continue, so will the potential opportunities for some activity in Washington. Thank you for raising the question, too. Thank you, Bob. And here's our last question. Is low pay salary of caregivers and health care professionals being addressed to curb worker turnover and or help prevent workers to going to other career fields? Yeah, I, the answer to that question is yes. I, don't, I know there's some specific bills that have been proposed that are pending in the Congress right now. Um, let's make an effort together to uh, identify them and address this person's questions with some specifics. But the answer is yes, there is activity and there's a lot of advocacy, tremendous amount of advocacy going on at all levels to uh, address that shortage of caregivers in the workforce. And it's, it's conceivable there could be some activity in the Old Americans Act in that space and the Family Caregiver Program. Um, and we'll, again, we'll try to follow up. And I want to mention one other thing in the caregiving space, if I could. The one thing that most people want to see who are in the caregiving advocacy space is a tax credit for family caregivers. There is now legislation introduced in both the Senate and the House to do that, S3702 and HR 7165. Um, and we'll put that also in a follow-up to this webinar. But for those of you who have been, who've been advocating, and I want to point out as a board member of ARP, I'm proud of our, of our leadership in that space. Um, a family caregiver tax credit is long overdue, and we have the possibility of doing it. Could, Julie, could we go to the very last slide of mine and just put that up on the screen? Um, because at least that provides a little bit of 
of resource uh, materials and contact. Here we go. So um, just look at that. Look particularly at the uh, how to find me if you want to continue the dialogue. Um, also, go to the Elder Justice Coalition. That has to do with the uh, funding for APS and the reauthor renewal of the um, Elder Justice Act itself. Um, and go to that QR code and, and weigh in. Because again, we have noticed since we put this QR code out in the street, so to speak, we're getting a lot of responses back from people who are actually taking action. And, you know, that's what it really is. You know, I can walk into an office and they're going to hey, I got another guy from Washington talking about this issue. But when they go home, members of Congress and senators go home and hear this issue raised in their local communities um, or they hear from people who write from their, their state, then um, they're more likely to focus on it. And so I urge everybody to do that. Help save APS. And I see Ashley's back on the screen here. So it's time for me to be quiet. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks, Bob. Thanks, Orion. We had a, you know, a lot of great conversations today, but before we conclude, I just want to briefly talk about the new online training for mandated reporters for adult abuse. So if you joined us in December, we did share this for the first time. We're going to go ahead and share it again. So first, we'd like to show you a list of Ohio's mandated reporters of elder abuse. As you can see, there's over 30 occupational groups who are considered mandated reporters in Ohio. This includes social workers, doctors, financial planners, pharmacists, real estate brokers, and others who work directly with older adults. Next slide, please. The online training for mandated reporters of adult abuse consists of two modules. The overall goals of the training are to help mandated reporters, one, understand their legal responsibility to report abuse when they have reasonable cause to su suspect it is happening regardless of perceptions, beliefs, etc. Two, be able to identify abuse and signs that suggest it could be occurring. And three, know where to report abuse. The focus of the first module is understanding abuse. It provides definitions of the various types of abuse, offers characteristics of victims and perpetrators, and explains why abuse is so underrated by mandated reporters. The focus of the second module is to help mandated reporters recognize and report abuse. It includes access, access to downloadable resources, such as the Recognizing Abuse Tool, which is a screening tool developed at Benjamin Rose Institute on Aging to identify suspicion of abuse. Since Ohio's laws are complex, Complex, the training also includes access to a man to a reporting protocol for adult abuse, which is a flow chart developed by Benjamin Rose Institute to help mandated reporters identify the correct reporting agency based on an alleged victim's characteristics. There is only a nominal fee for each module and continued education hours are available for nurses, social workers, judges, and attorneys. So here are the links to learn more about purchasing the training. Additionally, there is contact information for Courtney Reynolds if you are interested in learning more. We'll also put the links in the chat. So we want to thank you again for joining us today for Storm Clouds or Calm Seas, the outlook of aging policies for 2024. We had so much great, great commentary and such great feedback, such great participation today. We really thank you for joining us, and especially since we did go over a few minutes. Thank you again to our presenters, Bob and Orion. It was just really great information. Um, in the chat, we're going to share a link for a webinar evaluation that we hope you will complete. Your feedback is important to us as it does help us improve our, improve our programming. And your responses will be kept confidential and not in, identify you in any way. So just a, a few quick reminders about today's webinar. You will receive a link for it. We will also post it um, to our resource library and also uh, to our YouTube channel. Um, make sure that you uh, look for that email because it will have a link to today's PowerPoints um, and the PowerPoints will have all those great and important resources that Bob shared with us today. We hope you will join us for future events on Wednesday, March 8th from 9 to 10 a.m. Eastern Standard Time. We'll have our monthly virtual second Wednesday. Um, second Wednesdays are a great opportunity to network, learn more about Benjamin Rose, and discover how you can get involved in our work. And please also join us for our four-part virtual home buyer series from 6 to 8 p.m. Eastern Standard Time, Monday, March 25th through Thursday, March 28th. Our free HUD-approved home buyer education class can teach you the important basics of the home buying process. You can register for these and all of our upcoming events on our website, www.benrose.org. There you will find 
more information about all of Benjamin Rose's research services and programs. Again, thank you so much for joining us today and being so active in today's webinar. We hope that you learned a lot of valuable information that you can take back with you and share to others and get involved in these great issues that are, that are very important to us, especially right now. Thank you for joining us and we hope that you have a great rest of your day.